such a crazy world. Here we go. I would like to welcome all of you to the second of three talks in the Practicum Speaker Series this spring semester at the University of Colorado in Boulder. My name is Martha Russo and I have the honor of orchestrating the Speaker Series, which is made possible by a gracious donation from a CU Fine Arts alum, class of 2002, and the support of the Art and Art History Department. And tonight's broadcast is made possible by the hard work and smarts of Kirsten Stoltz, who was the coordinator for the CU Visiting Artist Scholar Program, and Thomas Yi, our video technician from the Visual Resource Center. Many thanks to everyone who have made it possible to bring this generous opportunity to all of us now in our fourth year of the series. Throughout this semester, our invited speakers discuss the trajectory, and evolution of their art practices and give insights into the strategies of forging a sustainable, fulfilling career and life in the arts. Tonight's guest is the absolutely otherworldly Sam Harvey. I had the good fortune of meeting Sam in graduate school at, at CU Boulder, and we've continued to cross paths the last 30 years, Sam. Can you believe it? We've known each other 30 years. Absolutely. I've always been taken with Sam's energy smarts about his work in the art world, but most of all with his humility, humor, and the desire to bring art into as many people's lives as possible. So before Sam starts his talk, here's a little background about Sam. Sam is a ceramic artist in Aspen, Colorado. He received his MFA from the New York State College of Ceramics at Alfred University in 2001 and his BFA from the Kansas City Art Institute in 1984. His work is exhibited widely, both nationally and internationally, and is included in many public and private collections, including the American Museum of Ceramic Art in California and the Brooklyn Museum of Art in New York. In addition to his vibrant studio practice, Sam is the owner and director of the Harvey Preston Gallery in Aspen, Colorado. The gallery specializes in contemporary ceramic art, sculpture, painting, and works on paper by nationally and internationally recognized artists. Also, he recently received in 2019 the most prestigious USA Fellowship Award, recognizing the most compelling artists working and living in the United States. Hope we hear a little bit about that, Sam. So, the way tonight will work is Sam, uh, while Sam is giving his presentation, you'll notice you are able to write questions in the chat with the host. I will be looking at those questions at the end and um, we'll ask as many of Sam as possible. So please give the warmest virtual welcome to the <laughs> fabulous Sam Harvey. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Martha. Thank you everyone for attending this, this session. Um, no, I really, really want to thank Martha for, for orchestrating the vision of creating this practicum because it's, it's, um, it's rare, but essential that artists try to figure out how to do their artwork and, and maintain a sane lifestyle. So uh, without any further ado, let's see the first image, please. So what you're looking at is a wall tile. And as, as the slides progress, you'll see, you'll get a sense of um, how I think about composition, color, and imagery. Uh, so th this is a, so this, this image and the next images, again, or some of my tile work and the scale of this piece is 13 uh, inches long by about 12 inches wide. And um, next slide, please. Again, composition and symmetry and balance are, are super important to how I think about um, the pieces I make. 
Um, you can't really see it, but this work, this piece is slightly concaved. So there's this beautiful little graceful um, curvature to the tile. Uh, next one, please. And then this tile, I, um, I started adding elements to it. So the conal shape is glued to the surface of the tile. Um, and again, you, you'll notice this as, again, as we progress, but you can see my handprint on the surface of the work. And I'm probably gonna say this several times, but for me, what that does is it records the actual physicality of, of my impression on the material. So it's a record of me having touched the clay. Next images, please. Okay. So um, I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, which is an incredibly rich environment in that it's a port city. Um, so there's lots of intermixing of various cultures, uh, sensibilities, uh, tastes. Um, and what you're looking at is a balcony, the second floor balcony of, of a building in the French Quarter area, uh, all dressed up for Mardi Gras. So, um, and if you've ever been to Mardi Gras, you, you kind of, you have a sense of what you're looking at. But this is the kind of imagery I grew up with. Color, um, color, light, shape, pattern, basic kind of um, aesthetic notions of how we see objects and how we compose, how we compose. Uh, next image, please. So uh, what I love about these images is um, age, a new paint job on the second image. The third bottom left image, I love the, uh, the fauna on the building and then the shadows. And then again, the last image on the bottom right is that old building that has, that just speaks of time and where. And um, time, but a kind of timelessness because that building may be gone now, but it, it resonates with, with materiality. Uh, next image, please. Ah, uh, graveyards. Uh, the graveyards in New Orleans are above ground because the soil is always moving because it, the city is actually below sea level. So mausoleums and, and graveyards, again, are above ground. But look at the, the texture of the brick and the concrete, and that sense of age and, um, again, structure and how uh, like tufts of grass are growing out of these, these homes of the dead. Next image, please. Come on, how beautiful is that, right? Look at the shadow of the post on that yellow wall that kind of like vibrates with, with, with color. Um, and then in the back upper right corner, the orange of the building behind it. Um, I mean, these things just visual language and seeing just like turns on my thinking. Uh, next image, please. Wrought iron, Spanish influence, 1836. Um, you can't beat it. It's like old world, new world. Uh, next image, please. So now what we're looking at is a covered jar of mine from probably uh, first year of graduate school at Alfred University. So having seen the previous slides, you can see kind of a direct influence in how I take all of that information from my history and my past. And I use it to talk about building form. And for me, 
form is uh, synonymous with body. So again, making making a way my in a way my body concrete in space, um, purely as 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 metaphor. Next image, please. Uh, Beautiful. I, I love coil building. So the, the way I, I build my pieces is through a coil, what's called the coil building process. So it's, so what you're looking at is actually um, the coils kind of stitched together over time. So for me, it's a record of how the form actually comes into being. Uh, next image, please. Oh, I love this little guy. This is a little covered jar that is owned by uh, my best buddy, Allegheny Meadows. Um, and again, you know, the, the, the magic and, and, and seduction of visual language and shifting the horizon line on a form like this. Um, and then kind of exit, accentuating the lid with just this soft yellow color. Um, I, know it's, I know this sounds really silly, but I love looking at my own work. So <laughs> there you go. Uh, next image, please. Uh, another covered jar. Um, and again, it's like, how do you visually, how do you portion form with color. Next image, please. Um, so I've had the fortune to do a fair amount of travel. This is an image uh, from Nepal, which I traveled to for about uh, four consecutive years. And again, that notion of material, age, structure, and use. Next image, please. Right, this is, this image would have been taken uh, mid 90s, like 96 or 98. But this is a culture that is older than ours, that has, that functions quite well. And there's a lot of hand, made and utilitarian pieces in the image. And again, it's just looking at how various cultures have sustained, sustained themselves educates me in terms of my placing myself in my own culture. Um, next image, please. This is from Italy. Um, it was taken in uh, the, the square, the Duomo area. And again, repetition of pattern. This is long before, I, mean, I took this image long before I started um, coil building, but somehow I see how it seeped into what I continue to do now. Next image, please. This is in Bangkok. Um, it's a temple that is covered in broken crockery. And um, unfortunately, this is not the best image of this palace that you can experience or see, but you, you really just have to go there and see it for yourself. But again, you can see how ceramics and the history of ceramics kind of helps me think about what I do with ceramics as a material. Next image, please. Um, this is a, a very large, difficult to move sculptural piece that I did in graduate school. And I was thinking about support and structure and what would be strong enough or have the sense of, of weight to support the object that's a, that it's cradling. Um, what's, what's funny about looking at this image now is that 
I came, I had been thinking about like how I was going to display a piece like this for weeks. And I just did not want to put it on a pedestal. I wanted to put it on something that was essentially like a building. So it, it, it kind of, the thing that it sits on is, is equally as important as the object, right? So, so that interface of object and support was, was really important to resolve. Um, next image, please. Here's another one. Ugh. So when I was in Nepal, I learned about um, the matriarch of the family uh, has all the grain and food stuffs for the family on the second floor of the building. And she knows how much food is in these various storage grains in the house for the whole year. And it was just remarkable to think of a culture or that responsibility of like thinking about the food for your family not and not being able to go to like, you know, city, you know, your local grocery store and buy extra grain. You have to plan for the year. And that that notion of planning and and the structure that the things that they keep the grain in are just beautiful uh, silos in literally inside the house. So this is kind of an homage to, to silos and storage. Next image, please. These are definitely, I mean, these are like my little love letters to Nepal and travel. Next image. Next image. Next, right? How, how travel and what you see influences in some sometimes direct and indirect way. How you start to kind of organize your own visual language. But I mean, these things are just so, so super beautiful and sexy and uh, I could, yeah. Next image, please. They just get me all worked up. Um, another wall tile. Um, next image, please. I love making wall tiles because for me, they're like, um, they're synonymous to like these beautiful Indian miniature paintings. And it's a way of, again, painting and making objects. Next image, please. Next, please. Next. So this is one of my, I, my studio tends to be its own world. And what you're seeing is the chaos of my insane making process. Like I work on a lot of different things all at one time. So I make ceramics, I make prints, I make drawings um, because the process of, of, of touching materials teaches other things that I make, teaches or informs other things that I'm, thinking about or making in my studio. Next image, please. Ah, oh, this is great. Uh, so on the right, that is green mesh. So I was thinking about um, what if instead of using color, I just used the mesh itself to talk about depth of, of the forms I was working with. So, um, there's a, in the middle, there's these three-dimensional ceramic objects with, um, there's, so there's a three-dimensional ceramic kind of teardrop uh, forms. And then on the far left, there 
uh, that's actually cut canvas that's been um, that's been gessoed, waiting to be drawn on. Uh, next image, please. Um, yeah, just a little nutty, but I just get super stimulated by looking and touching and thinking and feeling. Next image. Uh, oh, this is the Anderson Ranch. So um, I worked at, at this, uh, it's not a, like a, a straightforward trajectory, but this image is to remind me that I worked at the Anderson Ranch for nine years, assisting and helping Doug Kaspear, who was the, den, the, the, den, the then director of the program, uh, run ceramic programs. So what I love about that experience is that it taught me how to, um, how to strategize time because we were conducting either one week or two week workshops. So a workshop starts on a Monday and ends the following week on a Friday. So in between that time, those two weeks, you have to figure out how to get all of your students on the same page in terms of making, firing, glazing, leaving. So, and, and that's, that practice of strategizing is one I, I really recommend people figure out um, for their own personal practice. It's like, if you're gonna have a show and the show is April 30th, what are all the steps before April 30th that you need to do? Do you need to order clay? Do you need to, uh, how are the pieces gonna be fired? All of that stuff that, that, that kind of, the nuts and bolts of getting to the finish line is, is, is what you need to practice in terms of like looking at, looking at your career as an artist. Um, and I, I learned a lot about time management and how to manage others, how to manage myself, how to manage expectations. Um, so that was, that's, that was just a great, great, great um, experience for me. Um, the other thing I want you to think about is, is um, applying for either an internship there or taking a class there. And the place is really magical and it's in Snowmass Village. Um, I can't, I can't speak highly enough of the Anderson Ranch Art Center. Uh, next image, please. What's that? Oh, so this is the other thing that I am still a part of. Um, do you guys see that little message? Advice, consider working for a nonprofit or a co-op or a for-profit organization. Um, what the Art Stream Nomadic Gallery is, is um, my friend Allegheny Meadows and a few of us 20 years ago took this, literally this Airstream trailer, gutted it and built cabin cabinetry inside of it to display and hold ceramics. And uh, we, our first venue was uh, in Sika, an in Sika conference and SICA is the National Education for the Ceramic Arts Conference that happens every year in a different city. Uh, that year it was happening in Kansas City. So we had a deadline to meet. Um, we polished it. Again, we built the cabinets. We made the artwork to go in it. And we got, and Allegheny got all the permits because with, a project like this, you had he had to get the pro permits to sell on the street, to have it parked for a number of days, all of these these practical important things that have to be done because really we were responsible for all the artwork that was sent to us by fifteen other artists. They shipped it to they sh they made the work, shipped it to Colorado. We repacked it, made sure everything was priced, packed it in the art stream and in his truck, and then drove all of that to Kansas City and then set up to have a show and sale. So 
what that was about was instead of waiting to be invited to a show, you figure out a way to create your own show. You build your own audience. And um, what I love about now these days is that you can actually show your own work. Um, you can sell your own work if that's an important thing for you to do. It's not important for everyone. But if you want to share your work with the world, there are so many more systems now than there were when we took this project on. Again, it was 20 years ago. Um, I don't even know if we had cell phones back then. Um, and there was certainly no Instagram and there was definitely not a Facebook. So um, it, it, again, you as an artist think about um, running your own ship. How, how, how can you do that? What, what, what platforms can you use? What resources um, are at your fingertips? that you hadn't thought of before. Like, um, you, guys, you guys probably won't know what this means, but uh, when I was a kid, my mom had Tupperware parties. So, and she was selling Tupperware, which is this plastic container. So she would have a plastic, uh, Tupperware event where all, a bunch of ladies came together and she would have displays of Tupperware and then she would take orders and fill them. So in a way I kind of have that, in my DNA, and it just, I just remembered that. So, um, next slide, please. Ah, look at that. <laughs> That's hilarious. So, uh, this is how I build the forms. Um, no matter what the scale is, this is how they start. So, I have these plastic tubs in my studio with um, extruded extruded coils of clay. And so my extruder has a die in it that extrudes like um, probably nine ropes of clay at a time. So what I do is I extrude a whole lot of clay so I can just, so I could work rapidly without having to hand roll each coil. And because I'm a psycho, I have, terracotta clay, white earthenware clay, and two types of cone six clays, but everything's labeled. Um, and I have different kinds of clays because different kinds of clays have different um, reactions and different feeling tones. Uh, next image, please. Uh, this is, me doing a, uh, a painting and printmaking uh, workshop at the Anderson Ranch. Um, and next image, please. So these are some duct tape paintings and I was working on aluminum foil. And so I was drawing on the opposite side of the aluminum foil, but it was falling apart. So I started with the silver duct tape and then I thought, well, why just use the silver duct tape? What other, use all the duct colors and see how you can see, like go through the, the process of composing an image on the back of these ovals. So these actually are, are two-sided pieces, but I don't think I have uh, an image of the other side. Uh, next image, please. Uh, this is a print. Next, please. Another print. Um, go back, please. Uh, I just I love I love making stuff. Um, move forward, please. Next. Next. This is uh, one of the mesh pieces. Just using, you know, uh, mesh screen, screen door screen, and and layering it, and just enjoying kind of what that does visually. Uh, next. Uh, these are more current pieces. So this is how I, ultimately how I like to see the, the, the sculptures displayed. Um, 
Yeah, next. Oh, I love this one. Uh, this one's called Prowl. It's about 23 inches high by uh, 26 inches wide or long. And um, this is gonna be, this is silly, but uh, so the, the pink part is a wooden wedge. So they're made, when I hand build them, they're, they're balanced. But then I make these wedges to push them off balance slightly, just so that there's this tension that asks about balance. And you can see how the pink wedge echoes the two gray corners of the form. And this kind of like these, this, this visual, these visual tricks and playing with where edge starts, where it begins, um, where a thing is positioned is just really important to me to, to continually ask. Um, next image, please. Oh, man. So the, th the thing about, again, using coils to build the form, as I said, it is a record of how the thing is built, how it comes to be form. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Next image, please. Next, please. I love this one. This one's really actually about to fall. I mean, the tension on this one is really great because it really feels like it's about to fall and crash. And um, I like that. So yeah, I do it. Um, but look at this, look at the, the yellow bottom horizon where the, that when you get to the right corner, that corner just comes up just a little bit, which, which changes how you perceive where the edge starts and ends. Next image, please. Oh, so this is an image of the gallery and the gallery was actually started by myself and Allegheny about um, uh, 16, 17 years ago. So Allegheny and I were business partners for about 15 years and the gallery Prior to this name change, the gallery was Harvey Meadows Gallery. Um, and a couple of years ago, Allegheny, who lives further away from the gallery, he lives like 35, mil 35 minutes from the gallery. Um, after doing it for about 15 years, he really felt like he was, he just really wanted to um, concentrate on his, his art practice and make his work and spend more time closer to home. Um, so I decided to, to keep the gallery going, um, keep the gallery project going. So we're still, I'm still doing it. And um, I love, I absolutely love having the gallery and working with artists and working with clients and um, getting beautiful, objects and artwork into people's homes. Um, and it is a ton of work, I kid you not. Um, sometimes I physically have to take artwork to people's homes for them to live with for you know, a couple of days while they decide if they actually want to follow through on a purchase or not. Um, working with artists can be a pain in the neck because some people actually don't take great pictures of their work. So sometimes I have to re-photograph things for them. Um, and, but those days are over. It's like, you have to now send me good images of your work or we're gonna have a problem. Uh, next image, please. Advice, gain confidence and get comfortable exchanging money for artwork. You might consider taking a retail job to practice commerce and to get comfortable in sales and promoting a product. And this has to do with like, when you start selling your own work, it is so uncomfortable. It is so awkward. Um, 
for a lot of people. And, you know, it took a while for me to, to get comfortable. I'm still not comfortable with pricing my own, some of my own work. I mean, I have friends like, sometimes I call up, I call up a friend to help me price a piece. Um, but again, it's like consider working and, and this is, you know, this is, for some people, this is a hard pill to swallow, but, you know, consider working for, um, you know, I don't know, at a grocery store, at a clothing store, so that you gain experience on someone else's dime to get comfortable with, with again, that whole process of exchanging currency and just working individually with somebody. Um, because conversations have to, you have to establish a relationship and a conversation. And that just takes practice. Um, let's see, next. Oh, this is, oh God, again, I love working, I love having the gallery. Um, this is a piece by Kay Cesark, who is an artist here in the Roaring Fork Valley. Um, she teaches at the University of, uh, no, she teaches at um, CMC, Colorado Mountain College. And what you're looking at is a, so a clay object that's sitting in a, a vitrine of water. So this piece deteriorates, it's unfired. So it deteriorates over time. Um, next image. Um, this is a show that I had that Martha Russo was uh, in. Uh, so this is uh, one of her large clinge pieces. And in the background is a video piece by Nori Powell. Um, and again, uh, an image of uh, Kay Cesar's um, sculpture that, that um, deteriorates over time. Uh, next. Oui. Um, this is a show of Del Harrell's work and another artist whose work I love and his name is uh, Robert Brinker, and his work is paper-based. Uh, he does a lot of cutting out, cutting out of forms and then framing them. And uh, Del Harrow uses a lot of, um, he interfaces a lot with uh, CNC routers and molds to make his work. And it's just, it's just, it's, the work is fantastic. So um, again, it's, 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 I have this, push pull between my my personal career as an artist and what I love doing as a gallerist. Um, next image, please. Wait, um, seriously. That, can you see that the bear? The bear is a, uh, it's not a lamp. It's, it, it, it's a sculpture that has these tubes sticking out of it. Um, and then in the background are, um, photograms by this artist, uh, Brad Miller, and there are images of ice crystals. Um, and on the table is John Gill Platter, and then you can see a, kind of a, a horse candelabra with a bunch of candles sticking out of it or in, inside of it, on it. Uh, next image, please. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I love art, I really do. I've always loved art. Um, it, what art does for me is it, um, again, it, it, it excites my imagination. It, for me, and this is gonna sound kind of pompous, but it really makes life worth living. Everything else is just tedium. Next image, please. Is that it? Is that, uh, is that uh, those all my images? Yay, we did it. <laughs> um, oh, fantastic, oh. Sam. Oh my goodness. Okay, that I, that was such a great way uh, to end. Like I like that you didn't even know that was quite the ending and then you said that just profound, lovely, simple, 
yeah. thing about what art does to you. Um, for me, it's like the rest is like, I just make friends with the, with the rest of life so I can make art work. <laughs> yeah. um, I simply absolutely don't care about, but yeah. I don't care about um, art making my artist friends and the experience of seeing art. Really. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. It but was. Kind of, I'm a glutton, right? Like, I love. Uh, beautiful tapestries, weaving, photography, everything speaks a language and has a message. And it's like, what is that message? And how does it, how does it inform us as human beings within the structure of culture and relationship? Right, so and so I, I constantly have these questions about about art, my position in the world, other people's positions in the world, uh, meaning. Um, yeah, I can go on, but please, Marta. Rest, oh, rest well, me. <laughs> well, 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 you know, um, it was wonderful to see sort of the your older work, you know, I'm familiar with your, your newest work, but to see the work that you did in graduate school, that was really, really interesting. And there seems to be a thread. And I wondered if you would talk about this a little bit more ideas about balance and precariousness and, and these newer pieces that you make and then put a wedge underneath. And I wondered if you could talk about like, is that a metaphor for something you are thinking about all the time or just what's your relationship with off balance? Um, fragility. We are basically walking bags of blood and pus. <laughs> <laughs> Life is so fragile. Yeah. It's like it's, it's, it can be a little depressing and saddening but it also can be exciting and happy, right? But it's like nothing is given, right? right? And even when you think like, you know, every year we go on holiday and we go to this place and we've been going to that place for 10, 15 years. It's not a given that A, that place will be there or you'll be able to go to it. So there's just kind of, even though ceramics is kind of um, theoretically in a permanent material, it's impermanent because it can break. And I just love that tension between permanence and impermanence. Great. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. I hope I'm not depressing everybody. But. Oh, no, 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 no. That, that's, that's, you know, it makes, it reminds me of this Greek philosopher, Heraclides, who, who studied how opposites were, you know, just, just like a filament away from each other. So, so that idea of permanence and impermanence and, and happiness and deep, deep sorrow, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're all, they're, they're in the same pile. They're all related. So, you, you know, the mask of, of comedy and drama. Uh huh. Sure. But yep. the size of the same coin. Exactly. And that's why it's like, again, because we don't know how much time we have. Yeah, like, especially, um, now. especially now. Especially <laughs> yeah. now. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's actually being, it's, um, it's more illustrated now, but it's never. It's always been the case. Yep. It's just yep. more illustrated now because we have a pandemic that's that's at our doorsteps. It's so true, you know, oh. constantly. But it's like if you have an idea of something, how long are you willing to put it off before you execute it? And how much time, how important is that idea? And how much time do you really have? Right? Like <laughs> Anyone, I mean, ideas are the easiest thing in the world to have. But actualization is where the rubber meets the road. I mean, you can sit in your apartment all night long 
and talk about doing this, doing that, or what if. Right. So you actually put action into, well, until you actually make something actionable, it, it's nothing. It's just, it's just more air. That's why, uh, that's why uh, a lot of professors don't wanna see uh, your greenware work, right? Or unfired pieces, because it's like, we don't know what that's gonna be or if it's gonna make it. So yeah, exactly. It's like, you gotta finish the thing so we know that you, it actually exists in the world. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, yeah. So Sam, I wanted to ask you a few questions about, um, you know, you, you graduated in 19, was it 84 from undergrad? And then you got your degree, your, uh, your master's degree 17 years later. And what was, what would, like, tell us a little bit about what, what made you even think of getting your master's degree? Why that was was an important? Why that was important to you, and what you got out of that? And then, and then also just talking about what what did you do in between those those two degrees? Well, I moved to Boulder. I went mountain biking. I had <laughs> jobs that you could shake a stick at. I went tables. I um, I was wanting to live life, and I wanted to like gather experiences. Because when I finished undergrad school, like I didn't know anyone who didn't make artwork. And I thought my conversations have become super limited. All we talk about is like artwork, <laughs> finishing things, not finishing things. So I was like, oh my God, I've got to get friends who are like, who play baseball or who, you know, who do other things and talk about their art because I, I felt like it become like a, a, a run on sentence. So it, it really, I just wanted to do other things instead of always thinking about my artwork. Um, so I lived in Boulder. I uh, lived in Vail for a season. Um, I did a bunch of stuff. And then I remembered the Anderson Ranch was in, in Colorado. So I applied for, um, I took a couple of classes and then I applied for residencies, right? And then I worked there for, so I did a couple of residencies and then I worked there for nine years. And after nine years, I felt like it was time to, um, to advance my art practice because the nine years of working in, at the Anderson Ranch, I met so many smart people. And I felt like that there was a polishing that graduate school did for people and for your own thinking and the way you address art that I needed. Right, so um, after nine years, the, the other thing, this is, this is kind of a little funny. Um, so it was Doug K. Spear, myself, and we had two assistants. For some reason, we didn't have two assistants one day and Doug was in meetings. And so I was essentially operating two workshops at the same time. It was so easy. I was like, Oh my God, I'm running two workshops with uh, like 30 people plus the instruction, the instructors. I was like, I got this. And then I realized that it was time for me to stop and go to back to school because it was, it had fed me as much as I needed to learn. Yeah. So I needed to challenge myself. I need to, I needed to move to the next level. So that's that's why I went to grad school. Great, great. Yeah. So so Sam, here's here's another thing. I always marvel at you, and I'm I'm always kind of perplexed at how you do this. It's it's pretty rare that you know there's a practicing artist running a gallery of your 
you know, stature and, and, and for the longevity. Now you've been, you've been running the space for a long time. Do you, how do you do it? Like, how do you have the energy to do both? Would you like to just do one some days and forget about the other? Like, like, where are you with that, Sam? Like, cause it's, it's really pretty inspiring. It's, it's, it's like everything is a dilemma, right? Like you're a mom, right? You have, yeah. you have kids, you have a job, you have responsibilities. It's really no different. I have, actually I have it a lot easier because I don't have children or a dog <laughs> or a partner. So we all have to like find jobs in the world. So the job that I found and made for myself was having the gallery. So, um, so it provides me with somewhat of a salary. Sometimes it doesn't. There, there, have, there have been times when Allegheny and I weren't able to pay ourselves. We paid our artist and our bills and jockeyed the credit card for as long as we could until we sold something else. So um, yeah, it's a dilemma. Um, I work in my studio in the morning. And if I have the energy, when I close the gallery at five o'clock. Um, but again, it's, it's, it, these are all things I've chosen. I've chosen to run a gallery because I love, as I said earlier, getting artwork into people's lives. Yeah. And the other thing is I live in a community that supports the purchase of art. I mean, I could not do this gallery in Boulder. Right. Right? Yeah, no, we, we know. Do this gallery in Denver. Yeah. Because uh, Boulder is an incredibly educated populace, but they don't spend money on artwork. They spend money on bikes, uh, tights, gear, <laughs> food. Bikes. <laughs> well, that, that, yeah. well, that's that's pretty uh, pretty <laughs> nailed. And it's running shoes and you know sports equipment. Yeah, it's true. Um, but they're not buying artwork. Yeah, no. I mean, Aspen's a whole different system. Yeah, it's a different animal. And yeah. why I love living here, because um, culture comes to us in this little valley, right? And I also uh, snowboard. So I can, I haven't snow, I haven't actually been on my board in about three years, but I taught snowboarding for five years for Skiko. Um, but I love snow and I love hiking and I love being here. Um, so I get to make my work. I get to run my gallery. I am on two boards. I'm on the Archie Bray Foundation's board, which I absolutely love. Um, it's a great organization doing important work. And I'm on the board of the Carbondale Clay Center, which is um, in Carbondale, Colorado. So I've been on that board 10 years, I was on the Anderson Ranch's board for six years, and now I'm on the Archie Bray board. I just started that. And why I do board work is because I think it's important, it's incumbent on us as artists to make sure these organizations and institutions stay alive. Yeah. So I try to help raise money for them, uh, for all these organizations or give them artwork or I try to do my part. Um, because again, it's important. Culture, art and culture are important um, in, a, in our Western civilization. Yeah. I don't know if that answered your question though. Oh no, that's that's fantastic because I know I know with our this you know the class that accompanies this the series the professional class practice class I teach, it is the biggest question. You know the students are trying to figure out like how am I going to make a living? How am I going to keep making my art? And you know it's it's one of the reasons why I invited you because you are sort of walking proof of how you can do this. And, and, and I know it's not easy, but, 
but it's your passion and 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 you and you're making it work it's it's incredible well the other thing is like I, so i don't have a partner right and i don't have a pet <laughs> so, but I, I i i advise i tell people that when you partner up you have to find a partner that supports you and you support them and it's not a one-sided deal where you're doing all the feeding and they're doing all the eating, right? So it has to be teamwork, which is why the gallery worked so well for the longest time. Allegheny and I were a great, were great teammates in this business. And um, I supported his career, he supported mine, and we just gave it up for each other. Yeah. And, you know, he has, three kids and a wife, and for years he would do that drive every, uh, he worked three days a week, and it was 35 minutes each way. And when his oldest child went to college last, maybe a year or two ago, it was like, where did those 18 years go? He had two younger ones. He's like, you know, I've done this long enough. I want to make my work be at home with my two younger kids and, and centralize my time. Um, yeah, um, what else, Mark? So, you know, Sam, I have one more question where we've got a little bit of time left. I just wondered if you'd speak a little bit about um, your experience as an African-American man and with, you know, the heightened awareness with Black Lives Matter. What? How do you think, how, in terms of your own life, how, how has it translated into challenges or opportunities for you as you've gone along? <laughs> well, I, I said to someone earlier today, tenacity. Yeah. yeah. You have to be tenacious. Um, this is a little bit of a hard story to tell, but I remember being in high school and um, we had a, a counselor you know, a, a career counselor. And one day I was walking past him in the hallway and we and he stopped and he's like, well, Sam, what are you gonna, what do you wanna do with your life? And I said, well, I wanna go to college. And this guy, he was a white guy, he looked me in the face and just laughed. He just laughed. He goes, black people don't go anywhere. <laughs> Oh and he just laughed. Wow, wow. And I, and I was shocked. I was shocked because I thought that this person was an ally. And in that moment, wow. he realized that he was not an ally. Mm. Actually, a wall that I had to either go over or around to get where I wanted to go. Wow. So does this mean that like, then I hate all white people or all white men? No, I realize that this person is not one of my allies. So where I want to go is on the other side of you. So bye. I have things to do. Right? <laughs> yeah, brilliant. So, like you can't when people, sometimes people want to protect you and they say, no, you can't do that. And they may be saying no because they've never, never done it themselves. Yeah. They don't know how it works. Or they might be fearful. You can either ingest their fear or you can say, okay, I see your point and go around them. So I try not, I've always tried not to let people um, stymie me, right? I have yeah. desires, I have goals, I have, we live in an amazing country with amazing opportunities. And if you let people get in your way, you are stuck in the mud. Yeah. Right? I have been called the N-word more times you can shake a stick at. I have just, uh, you know, but that stuff, I. It weighs on me, but I don't let it stop me. So it's a battle. Yeah. But then again, you know, 
and what I've been telling people that it's not a um, it's not a black and white issue. It is yeah. the issue of people imposing their thoughts on other people. Like one of my best friends is a very attractive blonde woman. Well, the, the fight that she's been having to fight her whole entire life is like, you're pretty, you're a blonde. Yeah. Up and look pretty, right? And it's like, uh, you know, that, is, that is an incredible ba ba a battle. It's like she has something to say, she has something to contribute, but most men like objectify her. Sure. Right? And so we so we all have issues. None of us none of us get out of the situation unscathed, you know? Yeah. So it's like how how do you want to construct your life? What do you want out of this life? And how are you gonna make it happen for yourself? Yeah. And the other thing is like, how are you gonna be freaking kind to other people, no matter what? You know, it does mean no good to hate um, people who uh, are not my allies. I just don't have relationships with them. And I don't let it burden me. I, I, I just don't drag it around because I have stuff to do. I can't sit at home going, boo hoo, boo hoo. <laughs> but like, because I'm back. It's like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, Sam, that's, that's so, yeah. that is such a beautiful attitude. And, and it's, you know, and people you know, have policies. You know, it's yeah. Like, you, know, she's, you know, she's pretty. She's tall. She's fat. She's this. She's that. He's this. He's that. He doesn't right. do it. He's like, oh my God. <laughs> There's always something. So, oh, I'm sure. Try not to be burdened by it. Yeah, that's great. I I, I always my, my slogan's always been don't get bitter, get better. Uh, that's a good one. That's a good one. You no, know, and I and and I think if you just it, it's hard when you when you do push up against those kind of walls, and it's hard not to be resentful. But it is. It's a waste of time. Right. And, and there's just too many amazing things to get going. And, and there's too many amazing people to interact with. Right. So yeah. the other thing is like to fight bitterness and depression. It's mm -hmm. like circumstances can make you an embittered person, an angry person. But really, is that the way you want to live your life? Yeah, yeah. Pissy yeah. and mean and angry. It's just, it's... It's it's heavy and it's dark and I don't want it. I don't want it. So I, I, so these are the choices I've made. Well, they're brilliant choices, Sam, and we yeah. are all the better for for getting to share for this this hour with you and and I uh, and and beyond. So I want to thank you, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy life and, and really just being in our community for, for a, a very short amount of time, but a very impactful amount of time. Well, the other thing you guys is it's, it's a lot of work. You have to be prepared to work. Yep. And there's no way around it. Um, even I'm going to, one more thing and I'll let you go. Uh, even I have friends who are, are, um, who happen to be blessed with family money. Having family money can sometimes be the curse of death because it may prevent you from having a passion. Yeah. Right, because you know that you get the monthly check and it's it sustains you and it does more than sustain you. What is your passion for getting up in the morning? One of my friends, and I'm just this is an example. He's he's in his forties. He gets he gets a stipend from his family. He doesn't really have to work, but it crippled him. He's got two beautiful televisions, and he plays video games with people all over the world. He's wondering why he can't get 
a date or a woman to stay with him. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, you are 40. You are playing in your apartment with video games. A woman comes into your, wife, your life, what is she gonna do? Watch you play video games? <laughs> at, at, at your age, it's family time. It's constructing a life. Yeah, sure. You are a great person, but your growth has been stunted by the being in the golden cage. Yeah, that's and true. And everyone thinks, oh my God, if I had enough money, my world would be different. I'd be better and blah, 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 but not necessarily. You yeah. Still have, you still have to make decisions. So true. Yeah. Anyways. Well, thank you. Thank you again, Sam. And I want to thank everyone who's joined us here tonight. Um, we hope to see you back. Our, our next guest is coming April 13th, Tia Alyssa Anthony, who is a Denver-based interdisciplinary artist and curator. And I assure you that will be another fantastic night of learning the inside story about the myriad ways to forge a creative path in your life. And so thank you again, Sam. And I hope people can visit Sam out in Aspen. Please go to the gallery and see the magic that goes on there. And everybody be well, be safe, and have a fine night. Thank you. Get after.